Hello and welcome again to the second part of the lecture on Introduction to Medical Terminology. This is Dr. Stewart and I'll be guiding you through this topic once again. So let's go ahead and get started. Medical records are kept by all healthcare facilities, whether hospitals or physicians' offices. The medical record we'll discuss here pertains specifically to the hospital setting. The medical record documents the details of a patient's hospital stay. The record describes the patient's day-to-day -day condition, when and what services are provided, and the patient's response to treatment. All personnel who come in contact with the patient must complete the appropriate report. The medical records department is responsible for ensuring that all the documents are present, complete, signed, and in a specific order. Some organizations use electronic medical records, which are often referred to by the abbreviation EMR. The EMR is a software program that allows entry of patient information into the computer. Once patient information is digitally stored in the EMR, it can be analyzed to detect and prevent potential errors. The information can also be easily accessed and shared between healthcare providers, reducing unnecessary repetition of tests and reducing the incidence of inadvertent medication errors. This slide and the following slides discuss the common elements of the medical record. The first common element is the history and physical, which is written by the admitting physician. This section gives detailed information about the patient's history, any exam results, and an initial diagnosis. It also specifies the physician's plan of treatment. Another common element in the medical record is the physician's orders. Physician's orders include any orders the physician has requested, such as specific care, medications, tests, or treatments. The next common element of the medical record is the nurse's notes. These are notes completed by the nursing staff that record the patient's condition throughout the day. They include vital signs, specifics about treatments, the patient's response to the treatments, and the patient's overall condition. Another common medical element is the physician's progress notes. These are a daily record by the physician of the patient's condition. These notes tell the results of the physical exam, give a summary of test results, update the assessment and diagnoses, and give any further plans for treatment. Consultation reports and ancillary reports are other common elements of the medical record. A consultation report is written by a specialist who has examined the patient at the, at the physician's request. Ancillary reports describe various treatments and therapies. These reports are given by physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, social services workers, respiratory therapists, or dietitians. Another common type of report is a diagnostic report. A diagnostic report includes any diagnostic tests performed on the patient, such as those completed in the lab or medical imaging department. Informed consent is also common to the medical record. Informed consent is a document signed by the patient or his or her representative that describes the purpose, method, procedures, benefits, and risks of any procedures. The intent of this document is to make the details of the procedure clear to the patient. An operative report is written by a surgeon and it details an operation. It gives the pre and post operative diagnoses as well as specific details of the procedure and how the patient tolerated the procedure. The anesthesiologist report gives the details of any drugs given to the patient during surgery, how the patient responded to those drugs, and the patient's vital signs during surgery. The pathologist report is given by a pathologist who studies any tissues removed from the patient. The last common element of the medical record is a discharge summary. The discharge summary is an outline of the patient's entire hospital stay. It includes the patient's condition at the time of admission, the admitting diagnosis, any test results or treatments, the patient's response to those treatments, the final diagnosis, and any follow-up plans. 
Today, healthcare is provided in many different settings. Let's review some of the different types of settings. The first setting is the acute care or general hospital. It provides services to diagnose and treat diseases for a short period of time. A specialty care hospital, on the other hand, provides care for a specific type of disease. For example, psychiatric hospitals and children's hospitals are both specialty hospitals. A nursing home or long-term care facility provides care for patients who need extra time to recover from a surgery, illness, or injury before going home. They also provide care for persons who cannot care for themselves and do not have someone willing or able to take care of them. An ambulatory care center, surgical center, or outpatient clinic is for patients who do not require overnight care. These facilities provide simple surgeries, therapies, and diagnostic testing. The physician's office is an individual or group of doctors providing diagnostic and treatment services in an office setting. A health maintenance organization is a group of primary care physicians, specialists, and other healthcare professionals. As a whole, they provide a wide range of services in a prepaid system. Home health care is provided by agencies that offer nursing, therapy, personal care, or housekeeping services in the patient's home. Rehabilitation centers provide physical and occupational therapy in both inpatient and outpatient settings. Hospice is an organized group of health workers that provide supportive treatment to terminally ill patients and their families. These patients do not have to be given six months or less to live. They only need to be diagnosed with a terminal illness. Now, let's switch gears and talk briefly about confidentiality. Any information or record relating to a patient is considered privileged information. This means that you, as a healthcare worker, have a moral and legal responsibility to keep all information about the patient private. If you are asked to supply documentation relating to a patient, the patient must sign the proper authorization prior to you releasing that information. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, commonly referred to as HIPAA, sets federal standards providing patients with protection for their medical records and health information. If you have signed privacy notices when seeing a physician or visiting the hospital, you have signed them because those facilities were following HIPAA guidelines. Let's conclude this lecture with a discussion of pharmacology, which is the study of the origin, characteristics, and effects of drugs. Drugs are obtained from many different sources. Some drugs are found naturally in the foods we eat, while others are obtained from animals. Plants, fungi, and molds are other natural sources of medicines. Many synthetic medicines are also used today. Synthetic drugs have been developed by artificial means in a laboratory. Whether natural or synthetic, all drugs are chemicals. Every drug has a chemical name that describes the chemical formula or molecular structure of that drug. Chemical names are usually very long, so a shorter name is given to each drug. This name is the generic or non-proprietary name, and it's recognized and accepted as the official drug name. Each drug has only one generic name, and this drug is not subject to copyright protection. As a result, any pharmaceutical company may use it. For this reason, when a company manufactures a drug for sale, it gives it a brand name or a proprietary name. This is a company's trademark name for the drug. To better understand how drug names work, let's look at an example of a readily available medication that is commonly taken for aches and pains, ibuprofen. The chemical name for ibuprofen is 2-P-isobutyl-phenylpropionic acid. This name describes the composition of the drug, but it is tricky to spell, pronounce, and remember. Ibuprofen is the generic name for the drug. This name is much simpler to remember, and any pharmacist or physician will know what you are talking about when you use this name. The companies that manufacture ibuprofen market it under a variety of names. These include Motrin, Advil, and Nuprin. 
If you go to purchase ibuprofen off the shelf at your local pharmacy, these are the names you will see on the cartons. A prescription drug can only be ordered by a licensed healthcare practitioner via a prescription. A prescription is a written explanation to the pharmacist regarding the name of the medication, the dosage, and the times of administration. Antibiotics and heart medications are examples of drugs that are available only by prescription. An over-the-counter drug, or OTC drug, does not require a prescription. Many drugs can be purchased over-the-counter, such as aspirin, ibuprofen, and antacid. OTC drugs can have dangerous reactions with prescription drugs, and it is always best for a physician or pharmacist to advise patients about the use of OTC drugs. Certain drugs are controlled substances if they have the potential for being addictive or habit forming or can be abused. The Drug Enforcement Agency, or DEA, enforces control of these drugs. These drugs are classified by their potential for abuse as Schedule 1 through Schedule 5. Examples of controlled substances are butabarbital, chloral hydrate, codeine, valium, Oxycontin and morphine. Schedule 1 drugs have the highest potential for addiction and abuse and are not accepted for medical use. Examples of Schedule 1 drugs include heroin and LSD. Schedule 2 drugs have a high potential for addiction and abuse but are accepted for medical use. In the United States, examples of these include codeine morphine, cocaine, opium, and cecobarbital. Schedule III drugs have a moderate to low potential for addiction and abuse. Examples are butabarbital, anabolic steroids, and acetaminophen with codeine. Schedule IV drugs have a lower potential for addiction and abuse than Schedule III drugs. Examples include phenobarbital, and diazepam. Finally, Schedule V drugs have a low potential for addiction and abuse. An example is low-strength codeine combined with other drugs to suppress coughing. A prescription is not difficult to read once you understand the symbols that are used. Symbols and abbreviations based on Latin and Greek words are used to save time for the physician. For example, the abbreviation PO means to be taken by mouth and comes from the Latin term per os, which means by mouth. To be legal, a prescription must contain the date and the physician's name, address, and DEA number. It must also include the patient's name and birth date. Then it must be signed. A prescription is a set of instructions to the pharmacist, and certain abbreviations are regularly used in prescriptions. One of the most common abbreviations is RX. This refers to the drug prescribed and is typically followed by the name and dosage of the medication. Another is MG for milligram. This is a unit of measure commonly used to refer to the size of an individual dose of medication. SIG or SIG is the abbreviation that denotes the instructions for the pharmacist to include on the label. This abbreviation will be followed by the amount to take per dose, when to take it, and how to take it. Finally, DISP, or DISP, describes the amount of medication to dispense. It may be followed with a pound sign and a number. It may also tell the number of times a drug may be refilled and whether a generic drug can be substituted for the brand name drug. Congratulations, you've reached the end of this lecture. Be sure to watch any additional lectures on this topic. And of course, you are able to return to this lecture anytime you may need a refresher. Until then, thanks for watching.